a bit of an abstract one today. It might seem like navel gazing to some people. Um, but I had a thought recently which allowed me to understand things a bit more clearly. And okay, let me let me start with the problem. The problem is we are taught that God is om omnipresent, right? So he is everywhere all the time and in everything. But at the same time, he's especially in some places and especially not in some places. So, for example, he's especially with those who are trying to do his will. Um, he's especially in heaven, but he is especially not in the company of the wicked and those who do evil or basically wherever evil is. It's basically places where he is distinctly lacking in some senses. Um, so... But I was trying to, I mean, the problem is, the other thing that bugged me was a few insights into the fact that God is directionless, right? Because he is omnipresent, you can't, if you're praying, for example, he's not in any particular direction. It's not like you can look to the sky and say, well, he's there, but not on the ground, for example. But then if you say he's on the ground, it's not like he's there distinctly and then not you in the river or in your heart, right? Because he is in our souls as well. And so it was a bit, I don't know, sometimes when I pray, it's a bit of a boggling idea to me. Um, where is God? And the answer is yes. Um, so it then kind of clicked when it occurred to me that instead of thinking as like everything is something external from God, I mean, that's another problem, right? Because we have this idea of creation. And so as creation is something that God has created, it's something outside, external to him in a certain sense. Yet because it is permeated with him, he is within it completely as well. So this paradoxical idea that creation is something that is both distinct from God and completely permeated by him. Um, it is him, yet it's not him. And the best way I could understand that was with this idea that we are in fact all or everything is like an idea within the mind of God. Look, here's the, here's the difference, right? If I build a house physically with my hands, then the house is quite distinctly there and then I'm distinctly outside of the house, right? If I, if I am in fact outside of it. Or I go into the house, but then I'm distinctly inside the house. I, I'm not transcend. I can't transcend the house because I'm inside its boundaries, right? But God doesn't do that. God, in the sense, if a house exists, He built the house and He's in it and outside it and all around, right? However, if I imagine a house in my head, then what, right? Where am I in relation to that? And in a sense, I'm in every part of it, right? Because in a sense, the, the house is me. It's my idea. And because I'm thinking about it, my mental space is the thing that gives it being. It holds it in existence. And I, of course, am transcendent. I'm beyond the house, right? I'm not particularly bound within a part of it. But even if I imagine myself walking through its halls, then I can be bounded by the house whilst transcending it, right? And so... The other thing that came to mind is that when I build a house, I have to build it piece by piece by piece, and I have to put one stone on top of the other, and it's an arduous process that takes time and effort. It takes effort, right? However, if I simply imagine a house, then it's almost like the entire thing just comes into existence with basically no effort at all, right? And it simply, in a sense, exists, you know, it just pops into existence. And so when I think of God's creative power and how effortless and seamless it is for him, then it seems to make more sense that creation is like an idea, not that he had, but that he is having. The tenses here are going to be a bit tricky. And frankly, if I stumble over any of the accepted theology about this, go for that. Ignore what I'm saying. Um, because obviously it's not like, 
The reason why I say that is because creation is something that began in the past, but creation is constantly maintained by the power of God as well. Um, it's kind of, he, he sent it out to sea, but then he also keeps it afloat constantly by his divine power. And so that's why it's both, it both happened in the past and is continuing to happen even as we speak. So it's like God had an idea and then has kept the idea in his head. The other reason why that makes sense is because we're told that um, creation occurred through what? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, which means the ontos, the logos, and the ethos, through basically the power, the will, and the mind of God, right? And in fact, it's, it's distinctly kind of, um, it's distinctly attributed to the logos, the word, right? The mind, the intelligence of God is how creation came to be. Now, obviously, that becomes messy because it's not like the creation is in fact only in the hands of one of the three persons, but that idea is pertinent. But then again, will is a mental faculty, isn't it? Or a spiritual faculty. So in that sense, we're almost kind of told that it's the mental activity of God, the willing mental activity of God, which creates, you know. Now, here's the problem. People might say that if we're simply ideas in the mind of God, doesn't that make everything kind of ethereal? An idea, a, a house in my head is ethereal, cloudy, this ethereal, cloudy thing, which isn't really real in any real sense. Um, whereas the house that I build with brick and mortar with my bare hands, uh, that's real, right? It's got a physical, discrete, concrete, pardon the pun, reality that is quite clear, right? And so if we all just accepted that everything is just an idea in the mind of God, doesn't that really show us that tables should just be like ghostly and we should just be able to fall through ceilings or whatever? No, no, because our own power of imagination and thought and conception is just a mere shadow of what God's is, right? Basically, the way you could say it is like this. God thinks reality into existence. But his thoughts are so powerful that unlike ours, his thoughts by their very nature become real, right? We don't have that power. We, we're not given that ability. Our thoughts are, are ethereal because they're limited and because they're flawed as well and because they can be inconsistent. Gods are not. Gods are unlimited and they're perfect. And so they have complete and utter potency to them. So. Yeah, God might think a concrete wall into existence, but if you and I interact with that, that will hit us as hard as a rock because his thoughts can be real with a capital R in a way that ours just aren't, right? And so that's how I'm starting to think of it like that. I think for me that makes it so much easier to understand the omnipresence of God. And now let's make it a bit more personal. He's omnipresent to us because we're all ideas in his mind. So what exactly would that be like? Well, what would it be like? How, where's his presence in relation to us? Well, what would your presence be like to a character that you imagined in your mind? Right? So, so let's say for argument's sake that you imagined a character in your head. And let's also say for argument's sake that that character was self-aware and that it miraculously had its own will and its own subjective ability to know that it existed, yeah? But it's a thought inside your head. Now, where are you for that character, right? Now, in one very clear sense, you are all the way completely permeate its being, right? Because it's only by the very power of your thought that that character even exists. And perhaps only as long as you keep on picturing the character, does he in fact continue to exist, right? So you're intimately, completely interwoven with the character. Then, in another sense, you're everywhere, right? Because, you know, the brain is bounded by physical reality, but the mind, the actual mental space is completely boundless, right? There's no limit to whether you go north, west, east or south. You, you will never hit the boundary. And this kind of bubble, if you like, it's an infinite bubble 
is what contains this character inside your mind, right? But that bubble is you, right? That, that your mind is you. So that bubble of space that you can imagine is, is, is still you. So if the character is anywhere within that bubble, they are completely surrounded by your reality, by your mental world, and they're kind of swimming through that, right? They're swimming through your mind. They're walking through your mind. Um, and so if the character spoke anywhere, in any place, in any direction, so long as you were conscious of that character, then you would hear what the character says. And there's nowhere that the character could go, and there's nowhere that the character could, you know, if it walked into a building, it's not like it would therefore disappear out of your sight. Um, now, imagine this. Imagine if the character, by its own free will, gathered some materials that you gave it, because you imagined them into existence, and it built a place especially for it to go so that it could talk to you. Okay, let's call it a church. Then in that case, you would take it as a compliment when the character went there to speak to you. But it doesn't mean that you are only present in that place, right? In a sense, that's kind of a benefit for the character. Um, and I've, I've talked about that idea obliquely in a, lot, in a previous video about the fact that God's laws are all actually for us because it's him. He doesn't need anything from us at the end of the day. Um, but anyway, there's a couple of kind of loose, obviously imperfect illustrations there about what I mean. But hopefully that kind of makes a bit more sense. It, def it definitely helped things make a little bit more sense to, to me. Because when we walk through this world of ours, it's so hard to know sometimes where God is. You know, where is he? Because there are so many horrible things that we're surrounded by. And one of the things that really gets me is um, ugliness. Now, I live in a city at the moment which is quite ugly. Quite ugly. There were some nice parts though, and I visited them recently, and I realized when I visited the beautiful areas, how much more apparent God's existence is. Because obviously at the end of the day, he is goodness and truth and beauty itself. Um, but when you're walking through a really ugly kind of concrete glass steel metropolis, uh, which is like surrounded by pollution and litter, then it's like, well, this isn't really representative of God in the same way that like a beautiful sunset is. But that's the thing, like, if you understand that this is not, it's not like he is specifically there, and then specifically not over there, but he is everywhere because it's as if this city, now this city I'm walking through, is an idea that he has in his head. That he's allowed, you know, free reign to, for it to be changed and it to be interacted with by willing conscious beings. Then it makes a bit more sense. You can kind of see, oh, you are here. You're in everything. You're even in, dare we say it, in these ugly things that we see because they are part of your mind. They are thoughts that you are having. But then obviously there are, in that sense, there are thoughts that he approves of, approves of more than others. There are thoughts which are more evidently in line with his will compared to others because he's in a sense given us, he's given us free reign to interact with his thoughts, to interact with his mind and to shape things within it. So as we walk through an ugly city, it's still within the mind of God, but it's not within the will of God, right, for things to be ugly. So in that sense, it's less distinctly, less clearly him. Whereas if we see a beautiful sunset, something which is arguably just the pure work of his creation, we can see that that sunset is a greater testament to him because not only is it within his mind, not only is it something that he's dreamed up, imagined, perceived, expressed, spoken, but it's something that which is clearly in line with his will as well. And so that's why we can say that a sunset or acts of virtue are places where God is distinctly, all right? Not only in thought, not only in perception, but also in will as well, because his will is being reflecting through those, his will is being reflected through those moments. Whereas when we see things which are evil, uh, yes, God is there in perception because he sees all, and because, again, it's all part of his mind. Um, it has to, it can't have existence any other way. But 
those are not moments which are in line with God's will. You know, those are places in which, those are moments in which God's will is lacking. And so in that sense, we can say at once that he is in those moments, but he also isn't. So anyway, that's, um, like I said, a bit abstract today. Um, but if anyone has had a similar confusion as I've had, or a similar perplexity, and maybe that will help you in some of the ways that it's helped me. Um, and if I'm actually frankly just wrong about something, then please, by all means, let me know. All right. Thank you all. God bless.